So with trafficking, it's a bad guy in a black trench coat and a white van pulling up, taking your kid. This is theoretical. And putting it on a boat being sold for sex traffic, right? It's something you can point your finger at and go, that's wrong. Or that's a bad guy. The issue with exploitation is majority, vast majority of these cases are what they call familiar, which means it is a father sexually offending its daughter and recording it. So it is something that nobody wants to talk about. It is nasty. It is something that could be your neighbor. Um, so for the people to want to hear about that, it's a very hard topic to talk about. It's a very hard pill to swallow is that, you know, this isn't just happening occasionally. This is happening by the tens of thousands daily. We believe that you are strong by design and you were made in God's image to have a strong body, mind, and spirit. You're listening to the number one strength and health authority podcast in the world. So let's get ready to unlock your potential and transform your life in today's episode. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode here on the Strong by Design podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, a terrific conversation that we're about to have with a new friend of ours that uh, Jared and I say hello, Jared. Hello. <laughs> co-host Jared and I, uh, that we met in uh, Sevierville, Tennessee at Rise Up Con. We actually met our guest's father, who might be lingering around in the background. Uh, his name was Jack, and uh, oddly enough, he heard me mention Hope Children's Home, I think is how it went. And Yeah, we were at the passing, booth. We were at the just, booth across from them. Right. We were talking mm -hmm. with, uh, I believe, Adam over at at my fireside and uh, hope children's home came up as it inevitably does with a lot of people over the years. And, uh, and he heard it and we just get engaged in conversation for a while. And I found it uh, to be uh, just fantastic what he's doing, uh, what he did in ministry and what, what he's part of uh, with Operation Light Shine. And we get to find out all about that today with our guest, Brian. Uh, for our past listeners, we thank you for being part of the Strong by Design podcast. Uh, we thank you for sharing it with friends and family and coming back and listening every week, something a little bit different, helping everybody live a life strong by design in, in body and in mind and in spirit. And uh, whatever we can do to shed light on uh, an amazing platform like this to help a very real issue uh, that I'm glad is starting to get more and more attention. So our our guest today, Mr. Brian Waite. Brian, welcome to the podcast. You are part of Operation Light Shine. It's a, uh, your mission is to intercept task forces uh, or to fund intercept task forces, uniting federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies in a collaborative effort against child exploitation and human trafficking. And this has uh, certainly gotten a lot of attention in, in recent time with obviously t what Tim Tebow is, is, uh, has gotten a lot of social media attention, being a huge advocate there and being so beloved by the whole country. And um, so we just thank you for being on the show and, and sharing your cause. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jared. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's 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 uh, fantastic. Super excited uh, to to learn more about what you're doing to share that with our audience, who no doubt um, w will want to know what maybe they can do uh, in their community uh, or to help support you guys. So, um, obviously, how did um, you first get involved in this uh, as a as a path, uh, as a career choice, as a mission, uh, personally. Absolutely. So, uh, when it first formed, um, the founder and at the time the vice president of the board happened to be my uncle. Um, so I came from the corporate space from marketing, branding, and operations. I went to Nashville, which is where OLS first started, um, for a big expo we were doing, went out to dinner with the two of them because my uncle hit me up. I was like, oh, listen, I really want you to come over here. Well, we're about to start, start up and something that we're doing. I think you'll really be touched by it. So I went to dinner with them. They kind of told me about um, OLS, what their plan is, what the goal is for it. Um, I'm a father of two. Um, and as a father, you know, these topics, some of them I knew about or thought I knew about, some of them I had no clue about. 
Um, and just coming from, you know, the ministry space and growing up in that, it's all about trying to make sure you're, you're doing something right. You, you have a calling, you have a mission. You want to make sure that when you leave the world, you've made an impact. You know, I'm coming from the corporate space, made a lot of people, a lot of money, but then the day just kind of felt hollow. Um, so hearing about this, just don't listen. You know, I feel like this is something I would love to be involved with. If you guys ever get to the place of growth where you can monetarily afford a staff member, I would be involved any way I can. So about three months later, they gave me a call and that was over two and a half years ago today. So here we are. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people that's that's just finding purpose, right? Yes, sir. And in life, I think there's a lot of people seeking that um, and, and some people find it. Other people think they find it. And... Um, or what they, they find it in material things, but you're you're helping save lives and um, and and children help protect our children. And I don't think there's any more of a courageous, uh, meaningful way of of spending your time than doing that. Absolutely, uh, just fantastic. And oh, you know, it wasn't just a, what about a year ago, Jared, that you you Steve and I had a very nice conversation about the sound of freedom after going to watch the movie. Um, and obviously that kind of shining a light on similar, you know, very kind of that, I mean, obviously the same kind of, uh, of problem that we're facing globally here, what that looks like, how dark that world is. Um, and, um, it's, it's really obviously an eye opener. Uh, is there anything that uh, occurs to you, Jared? Yeah. Uh, I just, and Brian, it, it, uh, I'm guessing you probably have seen that movie as well. Um, and I'm just curious, is that a good depiction of what some of the things that you see going on? Are, are there things, uh, is that similar to what you guys are doing um, with Operation Lightshine? So Sound of Freedom, um, there's very strong opinions on both sides of it. Sure. Um, my opinion is, you know, it, it created a great conversation, right? I think the movie, when it came out, didn't portray kind of what the issue is truly. Um, but again, it, it can't, right? It's Hollywood. So they have to Hollywoodize it. They have to dial it up. They have to make it this big thing. But the, there's a little bit of miscommunication, misinformation from it. The depiction really makes it look more international domestic, right? It's like this issue that's over there. It's not here. When the fact is, the issue is here in the United States, here domestically, and it's it's rampant. And the real issue truly isn't just the trafficking side of it, it's the child exploitation side of it too. So while it created great conversation, also created, you know, a lot of questions that that nobody really knew answers to. So they went to social media, they went to all these places looking for answers, which half the time you're just getting hyperbole. You're getting things that people think they know about this issue versus talking to the true experts in this crime type and then getting true educational tools to kind of educate themselves on it. So proud of the conversation starter but it's really not what it looks like or how it's done um you know it's very it, it's especially domestically there are checks and balances and procedures right you can't just go kick in a door as a person and go save a child it's just it does not work that way it, it requires law enforcement it requires due process it requires so many things so for us it's just the depiction i felt could have been a little bit better but again it maybe had to be that way because of hollywood so Sure. What, what we and define maybe for us, since you know we have a lot of listeners who maybe are unfamiliar with this topic altogether, or just more curious. But it's always good to start, I think, with the simple, uh, the, the simple simplicity. Uh, the difference between human trafficking and child exploitation, what and what that you know what that is. Absolutely. So trafficking is uh, is the exchange of a person through force, fraud, or coercion. Right. So. It has some type of a monetary value, right? Via drugs, via money, via housing. There's so many different avenues that that falls under, right? So that's the trafficking side of it. Where the exploitation side of it typically is just the recording of a child being sexually abused, um, shared on the line, memorialized, and just for the sexual predilection of a predator, basically. There's no... There is no monetary exchange normally. Now, there, there'll be people that will pay for the act, but when it comes to the giant fight of what you're fighting is this, the file sharing and the creation of this content, it is just a sexual predilection. Um, there, there typically is not a monetary exchange from it. And I mean, that's 
one of the biggest and most rampant issues we're facing. Um, we always kind of bring up a case where we we didn't, but one of the biggest Startnet boards got taken down, had over tens of tens of tens of thousands of members. And when we ask people all the time, if you were to ask or we were to ask you, how much money do you feel that board generated yearly? Everybody's like millions and millions and millions. And we're like, no, it zero. Then, you know, there was some exchange. But in order to be a member of this board, you had to upload a video of yourself sexually abusing a child. And in order to maintain your membership every month, you had to continually do that. So every month, tens of thousands of children were being sexually abused, recorded, and then shared and memorialized on these boards. So it's a, it's a drastic, it's a drastic topic change from trafficking to exploitation. And a lot of times, you know, you hear so much about, you know, trafficking is the number one, you know, funded thing. And it's really hard sometimes to really get that right because nobody knows what somebody's being sold for. And trafficking is a bubble, right? So what that means is also labor trafficking, which accounts for any product sold through labor traffic is equated into that number. So when you hear billions and billions of dollars, that's not the monetary exchange of a dollar for a person. That's goods being sold. That's a lot of different things. So that's where we always want to encourage people to truly educate yourself on what trafficking is and then even inform yourself on what exploitation is too. Because a lot of people, if you were to ask them, do you know what trafficking is? Majority of people will shake their head. Now, will they get it right? Probably not, but at least they know what it is. But if you were to ask, do you know what sexual exploitation is or child sexual abuse material? Everybody would probably go, no, not really. And that's for us, the biggest issue is really bringing the awareness of what that topic is. What do you think the reluctance is for this to get more coverage and more attention? Is it because there's people who are pretty powerful and pretty wealthy that are involved in such things? And and I mean, I, I really don't care. I mean, they can come to my house <laughs> if they want. I, I'm not afraid of people. I just, it's sickening that this stuff exists and that it's almost like people are fearful or reluctant to talk on it well, candidly. Yeah, so the issue... I don't really think is that right. It is a, it's a narrative, right? So with trafficking, it's a bad guy in a black trench coat in a white van pulling up, taking your kid. This is theoretical and putting it on a boat being sold for sex traffic, right? It's something you can point your finger at and go, that's wrong. Or that's a bad guy. The issue with exploitation is a majority, vast majority of these cases are what they call familiar, which means it is a father sexually offending its daughter and recording it. So it is something that nobody wants to talk about. It is nasty. It is something that could be your neighbor. Um, so for the people to want to hear about it, it's a very hard topic to talk about. It's a very hard pill to swallow is that, you know, this isn't just happening occasionally. This is happening by the tens of thousands daily. Um, so I think it's just the narrative of the topic, right? It's really, it's a very sickening topic. It's something very, very few people want to talk about or acknowledge it right. happens here in America, right? It's really good to be like, oh, that doesn't happen here. Or no, that'll never happen to my child. Or no, I would never, I don't know anybody that does that when probably it is happening very closely to you. Jared, you're a father of four kids. Uh -huh. I mean, what what does, what kind of feelings with just talking about this or hearing about these underground memberships where it's not, it's not pay to play, it's, it's, doing this thing and sending right. in video content of you abusing your most likely, I guess your own kid sure. to, um, to maintain the membership. I don't. Yeah. I mean, it, obviously it's, it's gross and disgusting. I think about just the, the internet and what, what, what it's brought about in the last, you know, 15 years or whatever. Um, certainly these things uh, are not new. Um, it's just more, uh, it seems like, there's there's more opportunity maybe for us to see what's going on. Um, uh, my wife growing up was sexually abused by her father, and I mean he wasn't, you know, putting it on the internet. Um, but that doesn't make it any worse th uh, for what it was. You know what I mean? And so, um, thankfully, uh, my wife's a strong woman, and she stood up for herself and ended up uh, speaking out, and he went to prison for it. Um, but that doesn't happen very often. And so, uh, I, I guess. Uh, my question, are you guys more on the exploitation side then as opposed to the trafficking side, or are you trying to do, do all-encompassing? We, we do both, but the yeah. issue is the cases. I mean, it, it is a thousand-to-one trafficking exploitation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we are in a 
reactive state in the exploitation fight right now. I mean, we are mm -hmm. we are drinking from a fire hose. We are taking tens of thousands of tips and trying to stay caught up. And that's the majority yeah. of the issue when it comes yeah. to kind of why we started. And we can d dive into that later. But yeah. with, with trafficking, it seems like there's somebody to follow, right? But with exploitation, it's like m millions or billions of people just secretly doing something in their home. I mean, how... How are you even supposed to begin to tackle an issue like that? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that, that, that that's is half hypothetical. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's half rhetorical. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's that's kind of. I, I don't want to jump ahead to some, another topic, but that's kind yeah, of yeah. the issue is because we're in such a reactive state to this. It's due to funding, right? It's due to not having the essential resources, the essential technology the manpower to even start really moving the needle in the fight. I mean, that's why OLS started is to basically stand in the gap where the government leaves off with funding in the fight against exploitation and trafficking. So for listeners listening that don't know, um, the U.S. government last year in 2023 spent um, $40 billion with a B in the counter drug war. They just did their budget for 2024. It went up to $42 billion. Now, what you don't know is the U.S. government has funded for the past two or three decades the fight against exploitation and trafficking at $200 million with an N. Wow. Has not changed, has not gone up. Actually, just kind of got cut this year because they need a budget cut, so they kind of pulled a little bit of everybody's and took $2 million away from that $20 million. So for us, it's, it's, it's just really standing in that gap. You know, when we talk to law enforcement partners and people, in this fight like what what is what is going on what can we do to make a difference and everybody said the same thing we need help we need more manpower we need better technology we need essential resources so that's essentially why ols started is to give go privately fundraise and give those essential resources mm -hmm. to these people on the front lines trying to make a difference in this fight so are you guys on the front lines at all or are you more just raising some funds so ols to as a nonprofit is not doing the work up front, right? So we, we like to call it, we have our three pillars and that is to equip, empower, and educate. And as a nonprofit, we want to equip, empower, and educate the general public on the topics and the issues. We want to equip, empower, and educate law enforcement. So what we do is go privately fundraise to stand up independently funded task forces called Intercept. And what Intercept is, is a combination of state, local, and federal law enforcement agencies coming shoulder to shoulder under one, work, one roof with a sole focus of just exploitation and trafficking. Because the issue is with that funding, a lot of these smaller you know, local law enforcement agencies or sheriff's offices, they all have a narcotics team typically, right? It's because they have this giant budget to spend. So they have a SWAT team for narcotics. They have, a, they have detectives. They have this big unit. But if you go and ask them who kind of fights exploitation and trafficking, they normally don't have anybody. They do. It's one guy in a corner with a laptop that has no clue what he's doing because he's never been trained. He's never been educated. He's never been equipped. He's never had any of these things. So our job is to kind of find these networks of these groups of people working together, ask them what they need, bring them all together, and then, you know, supply them. We do salary replacements for first certain smaller law enforcement agencies. Like, listen, for your, we don't want to hinder our law enforcement any more than you guys already are. We understand funding is a giant issue. Defund the police is a giant topic. We want to, we're going to take your guy, he's going to stay with your department, he's just going to come over to our task force, bring his caseload with him, we're going to back pay for you to bring a B cop up, make him a new detective, but we're going to pay for his insurance, his benefits, his salary, his car, anything we need for this guy to now focus and truly make an impact in this fight is kind mm -hmm. of what we do. So those task forces are stood up in that way. Why do you think there's such an imbalance in funding? Uh, you know, you know, narcotics is it's it's sexy, right? It's cars, it's boats, it's houses, it's it's all these monetarily things that when you seize it looks really cool. But when you go kick in the door and arrest a father of three in the suburb, it doesn't look that good. And there's no mon the sad part is there's no monetary value to that child. It's just you saved a kid, good job, versus oh well, we just seized five million dollars worth of money in two boats. That we can go auction off like it's there's yeah, a monetary it's, value to these these isn't that funny how we we value a yacht and a, a mansion and all this drug money so much more than a human life correct and and that's really sad um 
that that's that's what it's come down to. But thank God there are organizations like yours, OLS, that um, are standing up and, and doing something at least. Um, it's it's really just it's what's also sad is that is it true that the U.S. is the largest consumer of all this child abuse material? Correct. So we're the number one producer and consumer of child sexual abuse material. And a lot of people just think that just means it is a guy here in the U.S. offending when there are platforms and opportunities now for U.S. based people to get onto a dark net site. They can pay basically anywhere from 20 to 40 dollars. And overseas, you will video chat and type in what you want somebody to sexually abuse a child doing on a live stream with you. And it's just disgusting, the issue that we are now doing it overseas and paying for this stuff to go overseas. Um, it's just, it's sickening, to be honest. So. Gosh, it is sickening. I mean, all we, <laughs> I feel like all we can, uh, it's like you feel helpless because you're so outnumbered um, and ultimately everyone's going to find judgment yep you know with with this dark way of of living their life i have a question for you did it come from matthew 516 let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your father in heaven operation light shine was that had anything biblical there or so, no no not in the origin it was more of shining a light on this topic right so it was operation okay. light shine um, yeah. Now, that verse is a fantastic verse that we use, I use occasionally. Um, <laughs> now, the name did not biblically come from that. So, Gotcha. So, I thought, I thought it might be worth asking. Oh, absolutely. Go ahead, Jared. No, it's good. Uh, just with sex trafficking, um, is that, I know that, like, we've had conversations where, where we want to keep eyes on our kids and things along those lines. Is that... I, it's not as intense as maybe exploitation, but is it a reality of of kids, you know, like being grabbed um, and then trafficked here in America? Yeah. So the, it's not that it's not an issue because it is right. But trafficking and exploitation sometimes do go hand in hand, right? So what that means sometimes is a father. I'm just going to use states as an example. This isn't anything like that. A father in Georgia may know somebody in Alabama that says, hey, look, I'm looking to have sex with a seven-year-old girl. This guy will then take his child, drive across state lines, and the moment it's moving, it's trafficking, right? Um, the moment it's it stops and performing, the, the actually perform of the child sexual abuse, um, that's when that part happens, right? So a lot of times it's not so much the nabbing and the taking as it is the father or an uncle or a very familiar person to that family escorting that or moving that child from one place to another to perform those acts. Yeah. I guess my question is, uh, what is the threat of letting your, your children play outside? Like we we know that that's a big deal right now where, uh, you know, it's not like it was when, when I grew up where we would just went down the street and played and we were outside forever. And then we came in, you know, when it, when it got dark out or whatever, that doesn't happen very much anymore. Is there a real serious threat that parents need to, to worry about when it comes to their kids being outside on their own? I, I don't think it's that I'm going to be completely blunt with you guys. I don't think it's, yeah. that big of an issue. I think kidnapping is an issue. I think people are crazy. Yes. But the sad reality is we're more likely to tell our kids to come inside and hand them a tablet or a cell phone to go to their room and be by themselves with that, right? They're more likely to be exploited because of that than they are standing outside. It's it, the People need to get into the mindset of this fight doesn't look like what it used to, right? So because back in the day, we didn't have mobile devices, games, apps, social media. So these bad guys would have to go to daycares, would have to go to playgrounds. They would have to go to where the kids were. Now, the kids are right there in the problem of their hands with social media they're creating fake profiles for. So the fact of your son being outside playing basketball, now again, depends on where you live. There's so many different optics to this. But the odds of your child being outside and something happening versus your child going inside alone with a cell phone, I, I'm more scared of them going in their room with their cell phone than I am of them standing outside. Um, that's just the sad reality of where we are as, you know, uh, in, in this state with social media and phones but the you know that they're more likely to be exploited or trafficked from that phone than they are through being outside because so yeah what i, I don't disagree with you at all yes. I, I'm, I'm right with you and like 
our oldest kid now is 12. Uh, they don't have devices at all, um, and they're not allowed to take any electronics upstairs, um, nor are they allowed to do anything really online. Um, but I feel like we're an oddity in that, and that most kids that are 12 now do have cell phones or, or do have online access. So uh, if you were talking to a parent that maybe they had young kids and they're trying to decide, hey, what's the right age or the appropriate age to start introducing technology to my children? How, what age would that be? Um, and maybe it depends on the child. And then uh, what's, what's the appropriate way? Because you can't just withhold it because then when they get older, they still don't know what to do with it. And so it's a matter of teaching. But uh, maybe what's the process of teaching and uh, what, what would you say is an appropriate age? Absolutely. So again, there isn't a magic number, right? When they hit 14, that's it's go time. I think it's really understanding who your child is and their maturity level and what they can emotionally handle, right? Because young kids, especially boys, think with blood flow changes and they think in different directions if you understand what I'm saying. So for me, it's really number one, understanding your child, right? Who, what what they do, what's their level when it comes to, you know, how, how responsible they are. Um, and then it, it comes down to there are options, right? So for us as as parents, myself, I mean, my daughter's 11, um, so I'm hitting that age right now where all my all of her friends have phones. But it's in this day and age, it's almost not possible not to have a device. Let me keep going for a second. But it's the right device, right? So we always say all the time, when you give your child a phone, you're not giving your child access to the world. You're giving the world access to your child, right? So what that means is there are options and there are things that you can do to give that child the freedom or the the ability to have a device, but yet safeguard it at the same time. So we are in partnership with a company called Bark. Um, and then what Bark is, is a safe phone. They have an app service too, but we, I have one myself that we give to my daughter. Now, this is not a device she keeps on her 24-7. This is a device when we drop her off at youth group at church, she has a device because we're not directly with her in case of an emergency. Now, with Bark, you put everything on this phone that you want on the phone. So we can only upload, I think right now it has two contacts, my wife and myself. She can never receive a text, a call, or call out to any number outside of what we have saved in there as mom and dad. So we're safeguarding it. She can't download apps. She can't send pictures. If it picks up on keywords as she continues to mature and we feel we want to give her more room, if somebody is texting her something they shouldn't be, it will alert our phones. We can see the conversation. We can address it. Um, so there, there are options to be able to give that child the freedom of having that device, but yet safeguard it at the same time. So I think it's just parents knowing where their child is at and then researching and doing the work on, you know, what are some options that we can do? Because that phone, it grows with the child. You can enable social media when you feel, hey, look, I really think we're going to give them a shot at this. I think they're mature enough. You can turn on social media. You can turn on file sharing. You can turn on so many different options to that phone now grows with that child. It's a good looking Google phone. It's not a weird flip phone for the child feels out of place at times because, you know, mm -hmm. for them at times, it's all about their appearance and what they have. So it's giving them a cool option, but still safeguarding at the same yeah. time. Yeah, with Bark, too, they have an option. I feel like they have an option that only works... I know, I know, I've looked into it like with different payment plans and stuff. There's like a cheaper payment plan. Does it go through your network? Uh, it's, it's its own. So it's, it's typically, okay. I want to say, I, I don't know the actual plan, but it is its own plan that you would have to pay for every month. Now, there is an option to download the app on the child's phone. It doesn't have all the things that the Bark phone does, but it does have a lot of parameters that then you can put onto that child's phone that kind of shuts a lot of things off for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great option. And the other thing, too, I think is is good communication with your kid and not letting them just having all this alone time, yes. isolated time in their room with a device. Um, we really encourage and, and mandate that my, my son's phone is used downstairs in the living room openly. Uh, there's nothing to hide. There's my wife picks it up and is constantly reading text messages or anything that goes back and forth between him and his friends. So we're and he's fully aware that we're we're monitoring this and looking in on it and um, letting him ask questions about things. And, and uh, he's going to be 13 in October. He's right at that age. The blood flows real. Girls are going to become a, a, a major thing here as, as a seventh grader. And um, 
you know, I, I remember me at that age, you know, and, and, you know, so this is the, the time. So any parents listening, you know, it's, I just think it's, it, it's really having a great relationship with your kid and, and making sure when, when they go quiet, when you're not having conversations, when they're not spending much time around you anymore, they're, they're, they're up to something and you need to kind of be in on it. You need to be part of it and you need to know, show them that you care. Um, they might not love it, but they'll appreciate it later on uh, for, for sure. I just, it's so important. This is definitely the, uh, you know, the concern I think that a lot of us young parents have with our soon to be teenage kids. Yeah, and the only other thing I would say is encourage them to be, be open to the conversations too, right? You, you want your child to feel safe in telling you something, right? So you have to, number one, make sure you're mentally prepared for these conversations too. Because the last thing you want is your child to come to you with, hey, look, I did something, right? I, I, I shared a picture. I know I shouldn't have. But if that child feels like, hey, listen, you're going to freak out and this is, it's going to be bad, like they're most likely not going to tell you. And like that's one of the leading rises right now is sex extortion through devices for um, suicide and preteens is people pretending to be something, requesting them to send them images. They do it. And at that point, they then flip the script. Hey, if you don't send me money, I'm going to share this with all your friends at school. I'm going to share this with your parents. I'm going to ruin your life. And these kids are literally committing suicide because they don't feel there's an option for them to talk to somebody. So just be open and willing to have yeah. those conversations with your kids in love, right? You know, yeah. we all make mistakes. You know, when, you know, as God says, turn the other cheek. Keep just be there for your child. Be, be relevant. Be present. Know what you're doing, um, and just lead with love. That's what we always want to continue to tell our parents. You know, so, you know, yeah. the child sometimes is being coerced. It's not like it's just just sending pictures to everybody it knows. It's being led down a path by somebody most likely they shouldn't be in contact with in general that's leading them to that decision so just be be ready for the topic be ready for the conversation be involved yeah that's yeah, good making it safe to connect um i yeah. think is always an important piece um and chris you brought up the the good point too about just being intentional about it about a healthy relationship with your kids and investing in them and loving them and and uh it, it's weird it's a weird balance between um you still wanting to uh control uh and, and give them that safety and at the same time trying to back off and, and let them start making some some decisions on their own and it's it's that push and pull balance that um i think all three of us are, are kind of in that right now as dads as we're trying to figure it out and it's it's a new world it's not like this is you know 2024 has never happened before and so uh what worked 10 15 years ago uh it, it's a different world that we live in today and so um, I, I really appreciate uh, just what you're doing, uh, Brian, and what uh, Operation Light is doing. Just because I think that a lot of times, a lot of this happens because of apathy on parents' part, as opposed to proactivity. You know, um, and so hopefully, listeners, if you're hearing this, and if you are a parent, um, you will be at least nudged in the direction to be a little bit more proactive in, in what's going on in, in your kid's life uh, in order to keep them safe because you love them. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm super grateful. I live in a neighborhood where my son spends a lot of time outdoors with his buddies on bikes and riding and finding uh, fishing holes and, and throwing the football and jumping on a trampoline or whatever it is they're doing. It means that they're you know, they're, they're doing what they should be doing at that age and not in the house on a device on a beautiful day, whatever, uh, just encourage outdoor activity as parents. I mean, obviously strong by design, we're always talking about health and fitness, uh, as, as much as protecting your family and, and having faith in God, uh, the, the, all, all those things overlap and go hand in hand and encouraging outdoor activity for your for your children is you know don't let the bad guys win just because uh they're out there you know um can switching gears just a, a touch here brian i want to know a little bit more about intercept task force like specifically what is that yeah so what intercept is i kind of touched on it just a little bit earlier it is bringing together the best of the best to solely focus on exploitation and trafficking right because 
we understand that not, not a lot of departments have the ability to fund a person to solely focus on this. So sometimes they're getting pulled for narcotics cases, SVU, a thousand other things, right? And what happens is these cases, because they don't have all the resources they need, just kind of fall to the side and just don't go investigate. So for us, it's being able to identify these, these players in these areas, bring them together, give them all the essential resources and tools they need to go out and effectively make a difference in the fight against exploitation and trap. So with that, we have five locations. We have one in Richmond, Virginia, one in Frederick, Maryland, one in Nashville, Tennessee, and we have two in Florida, one in Jacksonville, and one in Fort Myers and Naples. And what that is is state, local, and federal law enforcement agencies. And that looks different at each and every one. The main um, federal agency we work with is HSI, Homeland Security Investigations, and then all the local departments around them. Um, Because what we've seen is because of these lack of resources and funding, the local departments are already engaging with these federal agencies because they need help with cracking the phones. They need help with the investigations. They need help with the, the digital forensics that they need, right? So HSI has already have these, these relationships to where sometimes they'll be, hey, listen, we see what you guys are doing. You're doing a great job. We understand there are some inefficiencies and some resources you need. We want to introduce you to Operation Light Shine and kind of what they can do to kind of step in and help all of us come together and give us the tools we need. So typically that's how it starts is we'll either get a call from a local department already has that working collaboration with some local agencies and HSI. We do a needs assessment, see what they need, and then we'll try to go out and privately fundraise and then fund that operation so that they are solely focused now and become an intercept location. Wow. That's awesome. Do you find that the issue is more prevalent in the, um, you know, city areas versus rural or i mean is it pretty much kind of pretty even evenly spaced the, the trafficking side of course is bigger in the bigger cities because it's you yeah. know there's typically some means of export right so there's boats there's trains there's big airlines but when it comes to the exploitation side of it there isn't a there isn't a, a demographic there isn't an area right this this knows no race it knows no age it knows no it, it, social economic class, right? It, it is anywhere from CEOs to pastors to coaches to your youth group leaders. I mean, it, it isn't. It, it's it's people with access. Correct. It's in yeah. plain sight is the issue. You probably have yeah. seen somebody that is going home at night and doing that. I mean, that was yeah. one of the examples I gave. We did a, a turning point event, and they're like, you know, how likely is that somebody's here is getting trafficked? I was like, very slim to none. I was like, but. The odds of a child in this room going home tonight and being sexually abused by its father and being recorded, probably going to happen. I was like, that's that's wow. the scale of which this issue is. Yeah. Yeah. Remember recently I had to re- renew a um, a sexual abuse policy through because I coach youth baseball. And every year or two, you have to retake this, uh, this you know, watch this video course and take a, a quiz on it. And just hearing some of the stats were alarming, and it, it's, it's so prevalent among sporting um, you know, coaches and, and players, and um, it's 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 just a, it's disturbing and sickening. Um, I've never I've never ever witnessed anything or known anybody faced you know that I've been around in my seven years of coaching. Jared, are you are you you know all those years pastoring churches and stuff? It, did you come into contact with anybody that you know specifically was involved in anything like Not this? Not that or? I know that was specifically in with like underage stuff. No. Yeah. Doesn't mean now, it wasn't Brian, happening. Yeah, it, Brian. Without maybe have, getting into specifics, if you're unable to, is there a case that you're able to kind of talk about that was like a, a huge win for your organization uh, in in the last few years? That that kind of sticks out maybe uh, uh, above and beyond some others? Yeah, so the, we don't... So one of the biggest cases we actually just did, it was Operation Valiant Night. It was out of our Jacksonville Intercept location. Um, they arrested 27 men who came to visit a house to have sex with an underage person. Um, and in that, it got a lot of coverage, right? That was where the former um, Red Sox pitcher was involved in it. Um, it was a, I mean, it was all over ESPN, Fox. It was a big thing. That was our task force did that operation. So that was a really big one for us because it was such a large scale and a quick three day op, right? So it was big impact, big arrests very quickly, right? It was a 
proactive operation versus a reactive tip that we took in. So that was a giant win for us as a, a task force. That was the biggest one we've done yet. And, you know, we've, we hear these stories of, you know, we did a big rescue and the child we happened to rescue was, um, two years of age. Um, so it's, it's hearing, we don't get a lot of the information as it is happening because we have to have a barrier between us and the task force because we are a nonprofit. Um, but we do get to hear the stories. But for me, you know, it, it's the other side of the coin that a lot of people don't think about, right. Is the law enforcement partners that are doing this fight. Um, cause what you have to understand is this isn't just an arrest and then it magically falls into this case. Right. So the moment that phone is seized, somebody has to go in and view every image. Somebody has to go in and watch and hear a prepubescent child being brutally raped. This isn't like a picture with a naked baby. This is a person brutally assaulting children. So these guys have to do this every single day. Right. So for us and me, especially it's being able to give these guys some new software and some new tools to be able to kind of put a barrier between them and that content to give them longevity, to give them a sense of hope that, you know, every day they're not going in and viewing all this stuff and just beating their head against the wall going, we're not making a difference because of what we're able to do and provide. We truly are so hearing our members that are in the front lines every single day, literally telling us, thank you. Because of you, I was on burnout. Now I feel recharged. I feel I'm ready to continue. I feel empowered to continue to make a difference in this fight. So for us, it's being able to give them longevity, give them hope. Because a lot of people just assume it just happens, but there are people that have to view every single piece of evidence. And it's knowing that we're protecting those law enforcement partners as well and telling their story about this fight because nobody knows who these heroes are. And that's what they are. You know, we, we, we do some cool things and we provide a lot of great stuff, but it's not us, man. It is our law enforcement partners. It is them a thousand percent, you know, without them, we would be nothing as an organization. So for us, it's always about putting them into the front. It's always about bringing awareness to them. It's always about giving them everything they need to know that they are loved, that they're doing an amazing job and that we appreciate them. So, yeah, they're the, they're the hands, right? The I mean, they're, they're, they're the hands and the body of the operation. You guys are the kind of the mind and the, the coordination and, and all of this, the communication that has to happen in order to set this all up and make, make it work. But they're the ones on the ground and, um, it's, it's, it's just phenomenal. I mean, I can't imagine what that would feel like just to know that you, you saved one kid one child from a life of of i don't darkness and brutality that i none of us can probably imagine and i feel it just awful for anyone who's had to endure anything like that and um what kind of trauma and scar that would it would just sit within you i think for a lifetime i don't think you can ever overcome such a thing jared do you have any other uh any other questions for Brian regarding OLS? No, man. I'm just I'm grateful that you're doing what you're doing. Um, yeah. Keep it up. I, I'm glad that you brought up the the fact that uh, that uh, the the police need our support as well. Um, I went on a, a ride along with a buddy of mine 10, 15 years ago. Um, it was one night, uh, and he's a you know. And I, I walked out of that going like, man, every single police officer needs a chaplain. That's just like, well, because of all the stuff that they have to go through on a daily basis, it was, a, it was, it felt like insanity to me to me that um, some, I mean, some departments have a chaplain, but some don't. And, but it's like your partner should almost be a chaplain, you know, that's just riding along with you just to, to help keep you sane. Um, and that's obviously not possible, um, but I'm grateful for for what you guys are doing and being able to to bring that support um, to to these guys that that are working on the front lines to make that happen. So yeah, so, well, yeah, no doubt. I I truly feel that if our law enforcement agencies didn't exist, obviously, or uh, I mean, that would be the collapse of our country uh, immediately overnight. And, and, and for the few bad apples that are out there, because listen, we're all human. And so there are bad apples in law enforcement, and there's no doubt about it. But the amount of press that a bad apple gets versus all the amazing what? men and women that are doing it right, 
uh, is so lopsided and so depressing. And then you hear these calls for defund this, and it's no more funding, please. Absolutely. I, I you know, I, I have a, a friend of mine that's a, that's a, a Clearwater cop. He's my next door neighbor, and I just always feel good when I see his his undercover vehicle parked on the on the the road on the curb. It's a presence. It's a presence in my neighborhood. Every house within, you know, uh, walking distance knows that that's Officer James's truck. And when when you know nothing's going to happen when he's around, you know, Absolutely. it's just it's a good feeling. Father of three kids, and um, I, I just those men and women need our support. Yep. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Well, the people listening, obviously, no, no doubt, are are interested in maybe knowing a little bit more about how they can help support. Uh, Operation Light Shine. Can you please share the best platforms for them to go visit and to uh, follow you guys? Absolutely. So you can go to our website as operationlightshine.org. Um, we also have LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram at Operation Light Shine. And you know, for us, it's continuing to share the message of we can, we can all. There's power in numbers, right? We can all make a difference together. Um, so just educate, donate. You know, never feel like any amounts too little. That's what we always kind of teach people is like, don't feel you have to give a hundred dollars every month, right? Any, any amount, any dollar, one dollar helps. So just there's power numbers, just get involved. If you can't donate, share content, right? Share good content, you know, educate yourselves on these topics and just be involved. So, uh, that check us out. We, you know, we have some great material that we put out to try to keep our followers engaged with some really topics at hand or some good prevention tips. So anything we can do, reach out to us. We answer emails pretty quickly too. So um, don't ever hesitate. I, I imagine I imagine you guys have some recurring monthly uh, options there for uh, for payments. Yeah, we do. So we have a what yeah. we call our guardian program, forty dollars a month. Um, it's a recurring yearly program where we offer incentives. We try to send out quarterly gifts, custom guardian swag, hats, wristbands. Um, but yeah, just. You know, recurring giving is nice. It helps us to allow longevity and, you know, forecast for future needs and be able to provide more. Um, so recurring donors are amazing, um, but anything truly helps. So, yeah, uh, that's fantastic, man. Well, I so appreciate your time, Brian, for coming on. Um, appreciate your, your father uh, for uh, having a, a great conversation and being able to uh, make this uh, conversation happen. Uh, we, we were very excited to have you on the show and to uh, give you a voice on the Strong by Design podcast. So we, it's just uh, God bless the work that you're doing and, and your amazing team, all the people involved. And uh, we just will continue to pray for all of you to uh, continue to find success. I appreciate that. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you for a chance to get on your platform. Thank you for you guys as, you know, your platform and what it stands for. So I think we need more like it. You know, it's, it's going to take change, it's going to take power and prayer to truly, you know, change the culture and the mindset around this issue, too. So it's time for us as Christians to get involved. It's not time to bury your head in the sand. It's get out and pray, get out and talk, be involved. So thank you guys for your platform and what you do. You're very welcome. Uh, thank you, listeners, so much. Thank you, Jared, for being part of the conversation. It's always better when you're part of it, buddy. Um, we uh, are so encouraged by you following the Strong by Design podcast. We hope that you can go support Operation Light Shine and uh, find a way to give to support their cause. Uh, we hope you come back next week. Every Wednesday, a new episode drops here on Strong by Design. God bless you. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much for listening to the Strong by Design podcast. If you found value in today's episode, please subscribe so that more people can find out about our show. Plus, you don't want to miss any future episodes with the amazing guests and topics we have lined up for you.